I identify as a child of God. Shout out to my sister for a pretty cool t-shirt. We're, we're living in a time when it seems like society's having trouble identifying itself. If the Bible tells me the definition of gender and marriage and family, what a man and a woman are, what the rainbow means, nations and borders, if the Bible tells me these things, and society is not able to look at the definitions that are in the word of God, the God who created them, and decide what they identify as, we've got a, we've got a disconnect. We've got a problem. That's important because we continue to try to identify the main parts of what we need to know in these last days. We're looking at a society that is crumbling from the inside. Why? Because we've pulled God out of everything. The very definitions by which we identify ourselves, who we are, why we do the things that we do. And if you run down Psalm 2, as I've said in the past... The rulers of this age and the kings of the nations are trying to bring this conspiracy against God and against his anointed Jesus Christ in an effort to break the bonds of the rules and laws and moralities that he's created in his word. A Judeo-Christian nation that cannot continue. And so what do we do? We step back and say, we can do it ourselves. We'll make a name for ourselves, much like the Tower of Babel. But as we go into part six of the end here, we're going to move into the New Testament. But we need to identify the main character in the New Testament. We need to identify him and set some groundwork so that what we see in the New Testament, spoken of by the prophet, we can take seriously and take honestly, knowing that he's speaking truth and he does not lie. We're talking, of course, about Jesus Christ. If you knew in the Old Testament numerous people who were named to be prophets in the Bible, we were talking about last time that Daniel is a prophet because he was identified by Jesus, the Son of God, as a prophet. But did you know that Jesus is identified as the best, the greatest prophet, God's number one prophet by Moses? And we'll talk about that. See, back in Exodus chapter 20, Moses goes up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. Now, up until that point, God has talked to Moses like he talks to a friend. There have been no other prophets except Moses. Moses speaks to God. Nobody else does. Not even Moses' brother Aaron or his sister Miriam. Only Moses but there're going to come a time when Moses is going to die. And God is going to put into direction, he's going to put into motion choosing people that he will speak to, through them to the nation when the nation starts to rebel. They don't want to listen to God, they want to listen to a prophet, but then they kind of they fall off of that. So you see that in Isaiah and in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, you see their calling by God God says, you're going to be, I have you appointed an, a prophet to the nations. But back in Exodus, as they're wandering around the wilderness, having just left Egypt, we find this point where God says, go to my mountain and speak to these people. Don't let them touch my mountain, they'll have to die. And we see in chapter 20, verse 18, it says, now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Now they're going back to the idea that if you were to see God yourself, that you would die. God made that point uh, possible. He said, look, you can't look upon me or you will die. These guys don't even want to talk to him because they fear death. So they say, look, Moses, we'll talk to you. You be the spokesperson for God. We'll hear you, but I don't want to talk to him. We're going to die. Verse 20 says, and Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Moses said, this is a test. 
He's talking to you to put the fear of you, to put a fear of him in you so that you won't sin against him. You will know that God is real, that God has an audible voice, that he is at the top of this mountain so that you will rev- you will be in reverence to him. Not because you're afraid, but because you know that the God who's pulled you out of Egypt is true and real. And they say, nope, we'll talk to you, Moses. We don't want to talk to God. And Moses says, okay. And Moses draws near to God. He goes up the up into the thick smoke and he brings back the Ten Commandments. But if we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18, we see this discussion. God says, they were right to ask for someone else to talk about. They can't talk to me Directly, this is what he says in 18 verse 15 in Deuteronomy. It says, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet. Now this is the New King James Version, and so prophet is capitalized. When a word is capitalized like this, it means it's speaking about God or Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So the prophet is capitalized. We know that this prophet will be direct descendant, a direct pointing to God himself. It'll be Jesus Christ. He says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, Moses speaking, from your brethren, a man, him you shall hear according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore lest I die. He ties it perfectly back. He says, look, I'm going to send a man. That man is going to be my prophet. You need to listen to him because you asked for someone to speak on behalf of God because you didn't want to hear God when you were at Mount Horeb. He says in verse 17, And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet, capitalized, like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if it, if it thing does not happen or come to pass, That is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken in presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So God lays the ground rules for a prophet called by God. Now, the beginning here, he says, they've spoken good. I'm going to send a man, a man that you can refer to, a man you can look at and touch and talk to and listen to. I'm going to put my words in his mouth. You need to listen to him. If you don't, you're not listening to me. And that will be, it'll be commanded of you. You will have to stand against judgment for that. Now it's easy to see it these days. If you don't follow Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, if you don't accept him to be your savior, if you don't step into that realm, you can't be saved. You have been taken down by your sins. You have not had it taken care of by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the same thing. But you're supposed to be obedient to the word of God. And God says, I'm going to speak through Jesus. In this case, he's not named. We know who it is in hindsight. Thank goodness we have the entire Bible. We know who he identifies, the prophet. We know that he is Jesus Christ. But he does lay out more information about coming prophets, other prophets that aren't going to be Jesus, guys like Isaiah or guys like Zechariah, any of the minor prophets or the major ones like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. Daniel's a prophet as well. These men are going to speak on behalf of God. And he says... 
How do we know that he is a prophet of God? Well, if what he says does not come true, he's not a prophet of God. But if everything he speaks does come true, he is. And I'll see to it that that's the truth. He brings perfect information about who this is going, why this is important. God is laying the framework because he needs somebody to tell the Israelites and later on the world who he is and why it's important to know him and to accept him as the Messiah. We see this we see this kind of a thing happening. What happens when a good prophet speaks and nobody wants to hear him? I just told you, God made the words. I'm going to put my words in a prophet. You need to listen. If you don't, you're going to stand in judgment because you didn't listen to what I had to say. And I just want to show you a couple of versions and a couple of versions that just so happen to tie back into what's happening in our nation and in our world today. Because God is speaking. God is talking. God is telling us what to do and we're not listening. We're leading this conspiracy away from God, pulling him away from from everywhere and every place that we can have him. This nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles, and yet it's not happening. We're falling away. And why? Because we're making up our own truths, trying to define things immorally. Because an immoral person cannot make an make a moral judgment. A, 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 an immoral person can't build a a a structure or a lattice of morality. It can't be done. We are made in the image of God. Inside our heart is God. God tells us how to be moral, how to feel love, how to feel mercy, how to believe in justice. These things, being able to choose, being able to, to love, being able to develop and to build, to show mercy and forgive. All these things are in our DNA because God made us in the image of himself. But the minute you take God out of it and you try to make, you kind of mess around with it, Rubik's Cube it all around and make it up your, yourself, it's now not the truth. And you're living a lie. And that's what we see in today's society. Jeremiah spoke about it. Ezekiel spoke about it. And we'll get then to further on to show you what Jesus has to say as we introduce him as the prophet. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 30, moving into chapter 6, we see a lot of the same stuff we see in our government and in our time now. Now, he's speaking about Israel. Israel was the, the natural picture, but we see a lot of things happening that happened exactly to Israel happening to us as a nation in these last days. It's more than just Israel. It is now the world. Acts chapter 17 tells us that all that sin, while he was working with Israel only, all the sin that the world has committed, he's overlooked. But now that Jesus has died and is resurrected, repentance only comes through Jesus Christ. Sins have been handled. You need to turn away from your sins and to Jesus, no matter where you are, no matter what country you live in, no matter what your deal is, whatever you believe, Jesus is the only way. But nobody wants to do that. Instead, everybody wants to kill the prophets and walk away from the one and only prophet, the prophet, who can give us eternal life. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 30 says, An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? He continues in chapter 6, and I wanted to read to you verse 13. It says, because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, those are the poorest of the poor to the most powerful in the nation. That means everyone together is working in the same way. Even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. 
See that today? Everything's a deception. Everything's a lie. Every, there's no truth. What can you believe now except for what is written in this book? Because everybody is covetousness, has covet, they covet power and authority, power grabs, oppressive governments. You're watching it happen. So even to the least to the greatest, everyone is given over to wanting more. And how do you do it? You lie to take it. That's what it's saying. Everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they even know how to blush. Is that where we live today? watching people lie blatantly and then they're called out about it and they can't even accept it and they don't even blush they're not even it, there's no morality whatsoever by the way jesus said that in the last days lawlessness would abound the hearts of many would grow cold we are moving into the last of the last of the last of the last days this is what's happening here. Jeremiah is speaking at a time when judgment is impending. It's coming from Babylon. They will be swept away and many of them will be killed or captured and taken captive. And Jeremiah is like, just turn back to God. And they're like, no, we don't want to. <laughs> Were they even sorry? No, they weren't. They, could, they didn't even blush. It, it, it didn't even bother them. Are we living in a life right now where, where behaviors and activities that were once back in seedy corners somewhere nobody really knew about is being openly paraded around in front of our kids? Don't, don't, don't think for one minute that God is not up there knowing where he's going with this. He has a plan to deal with this. And we're standing as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot. Jesus spoke about both of those days. I'm going to read that again. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. Nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Verse 16, thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Look for the truth. If you come up to a four-way intersection, ask for where the good path is. Step into the path. If you don't know a Bible, if you've never read about it, ask someone who knows the Lord, what is the good path? Where is it to go? Because judgment is coming upon our nation and our world. Time is coming. You must know Jesus to get out of here. He says, stand in the way and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it, and then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Also, I set watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpets. But they said, we will not listen. I put watchmen, watchmen bring warnings. I'm a watchman now, and Ezekiel, it tells me you're a watchman on a tower. If you tell these people impending doom is coming and they deny what they, and they say no to you, that's, it's on their head, but you said something. I'm saying it to you now. There's a watchman on a wall. I am a watchman on a wall, and I'm reading to you the very words that both God and the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Ezekiel, and the prophet Jesus Christ brought to us. What did it say in Ezekiel in, in, in Deuteronomy? I'm going to put my words in his mouth, and if you don't listen, it's on your head. You will answer to what's going to happen. There, therefore, verse 18, hear you nations and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words. I'm bringing judgment because they're not listening. How about Ezekiel? Ezekiel is a contemporary of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is living in, in up until the point where Babylon comes. Babylon takes him away. Jeremiah stays in Jerusalem. Ezekiel is taken away in the Babylonian captivity. He is called to be a prophet 
in Babylon. And God says, I'm going to have you tell these people that came with you in this exile that they need to turn to me and repent, that this isn't over, that everything's going to be okay. And Ezekiel was made for just a time as that. But just I've talked about Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 5. Um, excuse me, uh, chapter 22, verse We'll start in verse uh, 27. I've said this before in another teaching. I just want to point it out again because it is so ridiculously accurate for what is going on right now. And we need to know that God's going to do what he did then. Now, if the sins are the same, he's going to deal with it the same way because he doesn't change. He's the past, the present, and he's also the future. And he's unchanging and immutable. So if judgment came this time, judgment will come when he has had his fill of sin in this place. 27 says her princes, princes are elected officials, her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood to destroy people and to get dishonest gain. Sound like today? Listen to this. Her prophets... Those are kind of like your movers and shakers, those who are your communications people. Maybe we call it the media in this point. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, whitewash. They, they washed them with whitewash. Seeing false visions and divining and divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord God, when the Lord had not spoken. A false prophet. Remember what we talked about false prophets? False prophets die. Because what they say doesn't come true. But what they're doing here is false information. It is This is the ministry of false and misinformation. The, the government is tearing people up and taking and destroying and killing innocently and taking dishonest gain. That's happening now. I think it's probably clear to see it. And then the media comes in and plasters it with whitewash and says, the Lord said to do that when he really didn't. Now you can say, well, it must be okay because the Lord said it. Lies, deception. God said, don't listen to the false prophets. Man, that's crazy to see it this way. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar. By the way, Jesus speaks to the religious rulers and says, you guys are like tombs. You're whitewashed tombs. You look pretty on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead man's bones. It's what's on the inside that counts, not how we look on the outside. And that's what they're doing. They're making the government officials look good, even in the midst of their wickedness. To, to include murder and theft and extortion and lying and deception. Same, same thing we're dealing with now. Verse 29. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So God says, I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land and the that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. I'm looking for a man to stand in the gap and say what needs to be said to bring this place back in. Remember, you had, oh man, you had Abraham who was asking the Lord, it's like, look, are you going to destroy Sodom? What if there's 50 righteous people in there? Are you going to destroy it? No, no, I, I won't destroy the city if there's 50 righteous people. <laughs> 40 people, 45 people, 40 people, 35 people, 30, 20, 10, all the way down to 10. Abraham says, if there's 10 righteous people in that city, will you destroy it? And the, the angel says, I will not destroy it for 10 righteous people. What happens? Yep, the city is destroyed. Lot and his wife, and his two daughters, the only four that get out of the way in judgment. Judgment comes, a nuclear strike on that city. And if you go looking for the videos about the evidence of Sodom and Gomorrah that they're finding now, they're talking about the the sulfur balls and the and the heat and the blasted heat that hit that place. It was like a nuclear strike. God can do it. God will do it again, as in the days of Noah. He says, look, I'm looking for a person to stand in that gap so I don't have to destroy it. But I couldn't find a single person and therefore... 
Therefore, verse 31, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads. I will bring judgment, and judgment comes. Judgment comes. <sighs> Did you know that even in the book of Acts, even in the book of Acts, in the New Testament, Peter is speaking about the prophet. He's giving this beautiful, this beautiful sermon at Solomon's portico. And he's talking to these men about Jesus. Listen to what it says. Chapter 3, verse 11. It says, Now is the lame man who is healed. Peter and John healed him out in front of the temple. It was God that healed him, but they were, but God was working through John and Peter. And people watched this wonderful miracle happen. A man who had not walked in 30, 35 years uh, had been been begging alms and they just say stand up and take take up your 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 bed and walk and he does and all these people see it to include the religious leaders outside the temple and so now it says now is the lame man who was healed held on to peter and john all the people ran together to them in the porch which is called solomon's greatly amazed so when peter saw it he responded to the people take a heart of what he responded men of israel why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate. And when he was determined to let him go, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. That's Barabbas back in the scene when Pontius Pilate puts him up in front of everybody and says, I, I, it's my thing. I have the choice. I'm going to release to you one of these prisoners. One is Jesus. One is Barabbas, who is a murderer and an insurrectionist. And what do they do? They call out to murder Jesus and they let Barabbas go. Do you see the picture, by the way? Barabbas, a horrible sinner, was let go. He was saved and released because Jesus took the punishment. A really quick picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did it for everyone, everyone, good and bad. So he says here, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which you are witnesses. You saw him. And his name, through faith in his name, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him, Jesus, has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. John and Peter had the opportunity to take all the credit if they wanted to. Yeah, I walked up there and I healed him. I touched him. I said, stand up. He stood up. I have the power in me. But he doesn't. He immediately defers to Jesus Christ. It is Jesus who saves our souls, who saves our lives. And it is faith in Jesus, not faith in John, not faith in Peter, but faith in Jesus that this man then was able to stand and walk. Realize the picture. Peter walks up to him and says, I don't have money to give you, but what I have, I will give you. Stand up in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. Well, how do we know this man had faith? Because he did. Can you imagine a guy walking up? You've been laying here for 35, 40 years, and a man walks up to you and says, stand up. You've been trying to do this for decades, and it hasn't happened. And yet he says, by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you believe in, if I believe in that guy, I'm going to stand up. And he... And he's healed by faith in Jesus. Verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did your rulers, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. The prophets talked about the Old Testament, that the Messiah would have to suffer, and it was fulfilled. Here he is saying the prophets talked about what happened. He exactly, he fulfilled the prophet, the prophecies given in the Old Testament. Verse 19, therefore repent 
Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. He says, because you killed him in, in your, you didn't, you didn't believe that he was the Messiah. You didn't know what you were doing. God was working behind the scenes because he had to fulfill these prophecies that said that the Messiah had to suffer. Because of that, it's been proven that the Messiah has died and raised again. You've seen him. You've seen his power. Repent of your sins. Be converted and have your sins blotted out. There can't be any better evidence than that continues verse 20 and that he may send jesus christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things that's when he comes back a second time which god had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began for moses truly said to the fathers the lord your god will raise up for you a prophet capital letter like me from your brethren, him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken have also foretold these days. If you didn't believe in Jesus, you didn't believe in what Moses said, all these other guys said the exact same thing. That a prophet was going to come. You are going to need to believe in the prophet. And if you don't, you'll be destroyed. <laughs> Verse 25, this is a really convincing sermon. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. A prophecy in Genesis chapter 12. And in your seed, Abraham's seed was Jesus. It was a fulfillment of the prophecy that the very patriarch Abraham got from God himself. The prophet has brought this beautiful picture. It's so good. Verse 26, to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities, from your sins. Peter, Peter knew, Peter knew who Jesus was because he spent three years with him. He saw him dead. He saw him resurrected. He had been refreshed and recovered after denying him three times. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, given the keys to the kingdom. He stands here bringing this beautiful report. What does he get out of it? Chapter 4, verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening, to get arrested and thrown in jail. For teaching exactly what Jesus said, teaching what Moses said, teaching what Abraham said, teaching what all the prophets said, but they killed all the prophets because they didn't want to hear it. They still don't want to hear it. Israel is back into the nation. There are a nation, again, back in the land in unbelief. That's the whole point of the seven-year tribulation is to get them to look back and see that Jesus is the one whom they pierced was their Messiah. And to mourn and to say, blessed is he who's come in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, so that Jesus would come down and come back and take control of this world. Then no longer will there be any prophets that really matter. It doesn't matter. Jesus will be here to speak to us directly. There will be none of this left. This is important because the prophet Jesus Christ was the final prophet. The one who spoke the word of God, the one who spoke into our lives, the one who spoke the very truth of, of what we need to do to be saved, where we need to go, how we need to do it, who is the Savior. And I identify as a child of God by accepting him, the prophet Jesus Christ, the Son of God, my Savior, 
to be mine so that he would die. His death on the cross was not in vain. It saved me and washed me from his blood that I would be made clean. I'd be given a wedding garment and the rapture is near and I'll be taken away in that. You know, C.S. Lewis talked about Jesus, and I'm paraphrasing his quote, but he said, you know, some people believe that Jesus Christ is a good moral teacher. He's a moral guy. He's a really good, he's just good at what he does. He's just nice. He's kind. But this can't be the truth. Because Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, which means it only leaves out, it only leaves two choices. Either he's crazy delusions of grandeur as C.S. Lewis says he's he's got the same mentality as a poached egg or he is who he says he is and we know we know that there is a lot of evidence that tells us that he is who he says he is It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, we're found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, well, your faith is futile. You're, not, you're still in your sins. And then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men, we are of all men the most pitiable. He says, if all these people, and in the Bible it tells us 500 people at the same time saw Jesus when he was resurrected in one place. And Paul makes it clear in his letter, he says, most of these people are still alive. Some of them have fallen asleep. They found, some of them have died, but go and talk to them about it. They saw him. But he says in this place, he says, if he hasn't risen from the dead, then all of this faith that we have is completely blasted away because it doesn't matter. We could be good people and we could believe in Jesus Christ, but if he hasn't risen from the dead, then we can't rise from the dead either. And then what he says is it's, we're, we're pitiable because we believed in something that wasn't true and we lived our life believing this to the point where we denied ourselves the fun of sin and the, the, the wretchedness of, of living a life to our own flesh. But Jesus raised from the dead. Lots of evidence about that. Both stuff in the Bible and, and documentaries and talking in books about him from other places, other sources that are not biblical. Jesus is real. He died and he was resurrected. And he was taken up into heaven. Like Peter said, he's going to come back when it's time. He's going to come back. That's in the end of Revelation. But he's going to turn Israel back to him. But he's got to do it in judgment because they don't believe. They don't believe he came the first time. They're waiting for a, a Messiah to come. They're going to mistake him for the Antichrist. But Jesus is real and you're running out of time and you need to make a decision. Here is one of the prophecies that Jesus speaks about that because he's the prophet, and we talked about it, prophet of God speaks the word of God. It's, it's truth of God and you need to believe the word of God because if you don't, you'll be held accountable this is one you this is one of the best prophecies Jesus speaks. Because if you're looking at the, the culture as it is today, do you want to be a part of this anymore? Because it's going downhill. You tell me one place where progressive ideology has made something better. It doesn't. 
Because progressive ideology pulls people away from the word of God, the rules of God, the morality of God. It can't happen. It's impossible. And God will let it. Here's what he says. Jesus speaking in chapter 14 of John. This is the last, this is the last couple of chapters he's speaking before he goes to the cross. This is what he says. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Well, Thomas said to him, Lord, we... We do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus speaks of the rapture of the church. He says, I have to go away. I'm going to be dead in just a few hours. I'm going to raise again from the dead. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens so that you will believe that I am he who I've been speaking to the last three years. You know who I am. The prophet Moses spoke about, I am the Messiah, the son of God. It's going to suck, but don't worry. I'm going to disappear for a while, but I'm going to go away and I'm going to go make a place for you to come. And I'm going to come back and take you to myself and we will never be split up again. The rapture of the church, that's exactly what it is, as Jesus comes to marry his bride, the church. And if Jesus is the prophet, and Jesus speaks the word of God, and the word of God comes through him, and we're supposed to listen to it, then we know that it is true. The promise is true. If you've accepted Jesus to be your savior, then you identify as a child of God. And with that comes many, many perks and benefits. For example, you get to go in the rapture and miss the seven-year tribulation. You have eternal life in the presence of Jesus in God forever. We will be taken away to a place where there is no pain, no fear, no injury, no hurt, no difficulty, no sickness, no anger, no deception, none of that. That we're being rocked, we're being rocked on by now. Accept Jesus to be your savior. Say, Lord, I need you. I can't do it on my own. My good works are like filthy rags to you. But because you were sinless and you died, you died for my behalf. You poured your blood all over me. I'm cleansed. Lord, I seek to be reconciled to you. Forgive me of my sins. Turn me away from my wickedly, my wickedly ways and let me follow you the rest of the very short period of time we have left here. You will be identified, given the Spirit, sealed for eternity. If your heart is true, and it's not just lip service, and it's not just say a prayer and then run off and live your life, turn to God and seek his words, because the prophet is calling you through my words. I can tell you from personal experience that it was the greatest thing I'd ever done. God, Jesus Christ himself, God has taken me down a path I had never expected to go down. It has been the most, Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no, no heart can conceive what he has for those who love him. I don't want to be here anymore because I know what awaits me. And every day that darkness gets darker, I will stand my ground. I will stand in the gap. I will be the one that he was looking for in Ezekiel. The one who wants to stand in the gap so that Jesus, so that God had a spokesperson. I stand here boldly identify as a child of God. But don't think for one minute I want to stay here. 
Jesus will come back and take us to where he is and we will be in his presence forever and I will see his eye color and I will hear his voice. I have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Jesus Christ himself about what my life was about. <sighs> wow. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Time is short. Seek the Lord while you still can. Because Hebrews tells us that he's going to shake all this stuff. This is, this is a cool verse. I'll close with it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. God is speaking now. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, Jesus much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. God is speaking through his words. God is speaking through his prophecies. God is speaking through the evidence. God is speaking through the prophets. God is speaking. Last straw. Last chance. It says, verse 26 it says, him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet one more, once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. He's shaking everything, because everything that is made not of God will be crumbled, so that everything made of God will stand. Where do you want to choose? to be in the crumbling earth that will pass away or to be in the uncrumbling kingdom of God that is eternal. The only choice you have to make is to accept Jesus to be your savior. I think, I hope this is encouraging. Now, we've now developed a, a baseline by why we need to listen to what Jesus has to say concerning prophecies in these last days because, gosh, he's speaking. And he's speaking. 2,000 years ago, he was speaking. It's coming true right before our eyes. I'll see you on the next one. Until then, be blessed.